there, there was at least two creatures that were inside of the whatever you want to call it, the vehicle. And uh, when it, I guess the, I don't know, it could have been the damage from the cra- uh, uh, crash, or it was the damage from the blast fragmentation warhead. But it was leaking, right? The, 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 the I, I would assume it was the cockpit, and it was leaking, and it was coming out. I mean, it was all over the area. It got on my, you know, my fatigues. I was in it. That was Jonathan Wagant. He was a Marine back in 1997 when he unfortunately was the first person to arrive at a UFO crash site. This video will cover three cases that give insight into the alleged U.S. UFO recovery program. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. I retired as a Lieutenant Colonel F-16 pilot from the U.S. Air Force in 2020. Along with flying F-16s for 18 years, I was also a specialist in CSAR, which is Combat Search and Recovery. That's actually how you would secure a crash site in hostile territory and bring back our people, basically the pilots and crew. How can you do that safely in a hostile environment? I was also trained as a crash safety investigator. I give my analysis on three incidents that give insight into the alleged crash retrieval program, the same crash retrieval program that David Grush whistle blew on in the July 26 hearings. It's a global program uses taxpayer dollars, illegal funds, amazing stories. That information is coming directly to your brain now. In 1996, the people of Virginia, Brazil, witnessed a UFO event that would change their lives forever. Call it another Roswell, if you will. It is a crashed vehicle that had beings on board mas que eles não poderiam admitir a população e entrar em colapso. Nada temos a esconder. Finally, the facts will be revealed. So this is from Moment of Contact. It's James Fox epic movie about Virginia, Brazil. That's the first case that we're going to cover. The first incident that gives some insight into this program, a global program that would actually be in tune and have to have actual ears to know what's going on and they would have to have the mobility the quickness to get to that area, secure it, and then bring back materials, organic materials, etc. Virginia, this happened in 1996, and James Fox released Moment of Contact in 2022. Fantastic documentary that covers this case. Big similarities in this case is that you have a wingless vehicle. A wingless vehicle actually, to me, sounded like a Tic Tac. Billowing smoke, okay, so crash. Crash from some sort of, seems like, conventional means, crashes into a field. Unfortunate, this guy basically winds up showing up at the actual crash site, and he also reports beings. The crash site is then taken over. The on-scene commander will take over. If there is a crash, the first thing is to actually secure the crash site, to secure it from people basically going onto the crash site and harming themselves. They're very, very hazardous. You're not going to want regular people just walking up onto a crash site. Most airplanes today have what's called composite materials. What happens is you have very small, strong, super strong filaments, that composite fiber. When it burns, it can actually float and get into the air. If you breathe that in, okay, it gets into your lungs, your body, it can actually cut into your lungs and kill you. So composites are extremely dangerous. And that's for a conventional US human made craft. Okay, I can't imagine what would happen if you have sort of alien materials, et cetera. But either way, every on-scene commander, their initial job is to secure the crash site, to make a cordon, to not let people in, to get hurt, et cetera, but also so things can't get out. Once everything is secure and safe, now you can send in your teams, investigation teams, to actually figure out what happened. So apart from the wingless craft that's somehow flying without wings or any visual signs of propulsion crashing, You also have beings in distress. It sounds like extraterrestrial beings in distress is what was reported from the witnesses. Here's James Fox giving a summary. There's so much going on. People in 1996 in Virginia, Brazil, residents around the city seen 
a wingless craft going down billowing smoke. Uh, a few days later, some schoolgirls were on their way home and they seen what they believed to be a, a being. And shortly after the military descended on it. Now your film goes into it in greater detail. It has uh, people who were there at the scene. There's just so much going on that even you didn't believe in this story when you first heard about it. Now you've dedicated an entire film to this uh, case. What changed in your mind? There's been very little reporting on this case. And we dig in on this one. I mean, we find witnesses that were directly involved, allegedly with the transportation of these creatures, people that were at the military base. We checked all their credentials. The doctors who worked on, one doctor who allegedly took x-rays of the creature under under the um, command of, of the military base. Um, I want to bring light to what I consider the most compelling UFO case in modern history, certainly since Roswell. James Fox said he talked to the people directly responsible for carrying the being, transporting the being, and the doctor that actually did the x-rays for the being, seen by the girls, and then locked down by the military. He's seeing everything locked down. She just says that she hopes that one day the whole thing will come clear and she will, you know, her word will be taken seriously and they'll know that she was always telling the truth. Your classic gray alien, skinny, hairless, no hair anywhere, no clothes, it sounds like. Red eyes, so very large eyes, red and in distress. So maybe it was actually burning. Its eyes were burning from our atmosphere or something like that. But either way, you have beings in distress. And then the final point I want to bring up on Virginia is how the actual process works to actually contain this. First, you have your initial elements, which is your military. You're going to use local military elements, right? The witnesses say it was large military trucks. So you're looking at Brazilian military initially until you have forces fly in as soon as your quick reaction force can actually get there. And that came, I believe, or what it sounds like is from C-130s landing nearby airfield without clearance. So the the person that was his name is, in the film is Military X that was directly involved with the transportation allegedly with these Capture, with captured beings. Um, probably one of the highlights of my entire career because I'm sitting in the room with a man that most likely, in my opinion, drove around an alien from another world. The level of detail which he provided, we had all of his, uh, we, we did due diligence we checked his background. We saw all the photographs of him in the military. He was who he said he was. He was where he, where he said he was. There was a very narrow window in which he agreed to meet with us. We seized the moment, met with him off the record, and convinced him uh, to come forward. I think probably we had a window of about 36 hours. It's, in my opinion from all the films, from all the witnesses, from all the civilian and military witnesses I've met with, the most compelling testimony I've ever heard in my life, because you've got a guy that most probably drove an alien around and had a level of detail of where it went, where it was picked up, and where it ultimately ended up. And then, to our complete amazement, we, we discovered that the Americans were involved and the, the Americans flew into the exact location where this gentleman apparently dropped this thing off. We got confirmation from a control officer, uh, I guess it would be the equivalent of the FAA, who monitors all the airspace in and out of Brazil in that particular region, confirming that a, a secret mission came in from the United States Air Force to the exact location in Campinas, um, Espesex military base, um, and pick something up and then flew back to the United States. They didn't have clearance to actually land. Normally you have to get approval to land prior to an airfield before going there, make sure the facilities are available, that they can support your aircraft even, and that they allow you to land, that they're open. In this case, people in the tower reported to James Fox that C-130s landed okay, without clearance. Special forces use it. It's a small aircraft, small cargo aircraft, can get into austere fields, can basically land almost anywhere. And then 
James Fox talks with a family who was talked to, interrogated, if you will, by men in black. So you have people showing up, unidentified people. They don't know who they were. They don't have any contact information, et cetera, supposedly offering them money to keep quiet and to move from that area. This is all again in Moment of Contact. I recommend you guys watch that movie, amazing movie. So that is the first case, January, 1996. And now you're gonna see some very clear parallels between the next case, which happened just a following year in neighboring country, Peru, in Peru. Anyway, I was I was in the front with Sergeant Allen and Sergeant Atkins. We were up front and we were, we were point basically and we were like, I don't know, 10, 20 meters and ahead of everyone else. We had we all had maps and radios and compasses, so we knew so we wouldn't get lost. And basically, we were the first ones to see the object. And basically, what happened is we didn't go straight up the hill because basically this thing went up the hill and then off into the side of, 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 of the ravine of the ridge. This is about a 200-foot ridge at least, solid granite. Or, I mean, I don't, it's rock. I don't know if it's granite. It's just, was buried in, a, in the side of a cliff. But anyway, we didn't go straight up. We went to the, to the, to on to the left and walked up to the top of the ridge. And that's when we saw the craft. This is a huge ship. And, you know, I, I used to be in the sci-fi movies when I was a kid, but this is nothing like I'd ever seen. And when I first saw it, you know, I was scared. It scared the, you know, the heck out of me. You know, I didn't know what to do. And, and it was just, I was con really, it was really confusing. So we, I went, we all climbed down and um, it was, it was buried for about a 45 degree angle and into the side of the, uh, into the, into the side of the, the, the cliff there, the, the, the ridge. Dr. Greer with Lance Corporal Jonathan Wagen. This is the only interview until just this past week, literally last week, Martin Willis, so a friend of the show, tracked down Jonathan and actually convinced him to do an interview. His only interview since 2001, that one I just showed. And in this one, you can tell he's definitely been weathered by having this burden on his shoulders for all those years. He doesn't get much more information, but he does corroborate a few key points. So Lance Corporal Jonathan Wagant was a stinger operator. The Marines are their own smaller, complete fighting force, which means they have their own air defense. Right? They have their own fighters. So Jonathan was in one of these teams. He was an air defense fighter. So he would go around expert in taking aircraft down, shooting aircraft down, which is interesting. He overhears two women controllers saying that they're tracking objects coming from space. So objects coming from space and moving way too fast for them to track. So what he was saying is Mach 20 or 30. After he hears about these instances, he's called out actually called on a quick reaction force. So a team to go and check out what they thought could be a friendly aircraft down. What turns out is it wasn't a friendly aircraft. It was actually this amazing object careened itself into the side of a granite mountain. So a granite mountain, you can imagine that. Let's listen to Jonathan's account as he comes up on the craft. There was three holes. And I guess I'd assume that they were hatches, but I, I, there's no way to tell. They were not flush with the uh, with with the body, the main body of the craft. There, I don't know, a few inches below. I knew there was one on top because you could s slightly see it. I don't know about the other side, but th there was another hatch, the same same width and diameter or whatever of the top hatch, and it was kind of crooked to the side, and it was half open. And I didn't see any lights or anything coming out of it, but uh, I felt this presence. That it's real strange. I guess it was almost like I think the Cree, I, I told Leslie this, I thought the creatures were, they conned me and, and it was like weird. And they were, I think they were trying to communicate with me, like I guess telepathically. It's really weird and I don't believe in, in any of that stuff. But anyway, it was, I could, I could hear like, and it was terrible because it, it kept going and, and then it still comes and goes. It's like basically sitting in your car and turn on like an AM station. That's not, you know, it's just white noise and it's turning it up really high. And that's what I heard when I, when I first got in there. Uh, this is pretty crude two dimensional drawing, but this is jungle here. And this was the craft and it, it was embedded uh, in, 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 in the rock like this. And I, I'm not sure if this tapered off or, or how it went, but uh, these right here are the hatches. These two objects here, 
This one was the one that was half open, and you could see into it, but, I mean, it was just black. It was like looking into a closet. Ten meters in width and about 20 meters in length. I'm just not sure. That's just an estimate from what I remember. But it was huge. I mean, it was big, man. And it was shaped like almost like between an egg and like a teardrop almost. It was really, it looked really aerodynamic, at least in the shape. But the closer I, I was close enough to take out detail on it, but every, every, it was not just smooth. There was, there was, you know, there was bumps and, you know, notches and things in it. It was really organic. It was almost like art. I, that, that, that's really how you would, it didn't look like something that, that somebody made in a shop, you know. It didn't have that clunkiness or that that that, that tin can, you know, kind of deal. It was more of a it was more of art, I would I would say. It looked to be that it was it, it could have been handmade, but you know, out of what and what materials, I don't know. Definitely not nothing like it, nothing like titanium. It wasn't it see, this is the whole thing. It looked metal, but it, it didn't it didn't have any reflection on it, man. I mean, you know, the the the, the sun's coming down and if you got something made of metal, regardless of it. I mean, maybe if it's subdued with paint and it's got a cami sheen on it, you know, you're not going to see a reflection. But you know, I could see the different the different shades of the craft. They didn't shine. It, it just like it was. It didn't reflect anything. And and I guarantee if I if I threw like a, a flashlight on, it wouldn't reflect it. There's a link to all of these interviews in the description. I can't cover all of them. These are hours of interviews essentially. So check out the links in the description. But here is his description of the craft in the side of this cliff. He said a 200 foot cliff face. He says the craft is 20 meters long and he said it was maybe 10 meters wide. So 30 feet wide, that cannot fit inside of a C5. I checked it, so I don't know how you would move this thing. He also talks about the holes. You couldn't see in, it was just black. It was just black inside, like the light did not go in. And he mentions in his discussion interview with Martin Willis that there was a hand actually sticking out of this. And he could see four fingers. He says there's four fingers on a hand and the arm, a skinny, thin arm hanging out of this when the supposed beings are talking to him, trying to communicate with him telepathically. Interesting point he talks about here is there's no shadows made by the craft. So on, on the hillside, he said, where there should have been a shadow, from the sun, there was no shadow, meaning that the light kind of bends around it or is slippery of some kind. It doesn't impart a shadow. It's more like the light slips around it. The second thing he mentions is that it has battle damage. So he says the battle damage here, he mentioned these look like gills. So these are slits built into the craft. He said that could be the, the actual propulsion. He said he couldn't see on the other side. Is there another set of these three gills? on the other side, but these are vents. And again, he said there was no shadow in here. It was just like no shadow from the sun, just black, if you will. But here is where he said there was your actual damage. So you're looking at battle damage. And he relates in his interview with Martin Willis that it looked like serious battle damage. Meaning if you fragged one of our aircraft with this, with this weapon, he believes it was a Hawk home all the way killer. If you fragged a normal aircraft, it would destroy that whole aircraft, totally take it down. So this sort of battle damage, Jonathan says, could only not take down an A-10 or one of the Sukhoi, the Frogfoot. These are hardened aircraft, basically. The A-10 has a bathtub built out of titanium inside of it that is bulletproof, essentially. The aircraft are made to be punctured. Normal aircraft are not. If an F-16 takes any sort of damage like this at speed, it will just explode. It will essentially burn up and explode. Jonathan seems very surprised that this did not destroy this object. So didn't destroy it, just went through it. Okay, so serious, serious frag damage that should have destroyed any known aircraft that he knew about at the time. And by the way, his, his job was destroying aircraft. And Jonathan knew that they were tracking these supposed objects, super fast traveling objects from space. Next element to cover here is there was this strange material. He said it from the gashes. From a giant gash, it was leaking this liquid. So it was like a liquid. And when you look at this craft, okay, not, not just the sunlight, the sunlight blocking it, but it was also changing color. Was it the liquid on top of it, which is like a soap liquid, changing to a rainbow of colors? Because he said it was primarily green and purple is the actual liquid. And he got this liquid on him. 
So ruined his fatigues, ate through them. So there were some biological effects. Simply speculation on my part. And this is, and I don't want to go further with this because I really don't know. I don't know. But anyway, I think somehow that the, 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 there was at least two creatures that were inside of the, whatever you want to call it, the vehicle. And uh, when it, I guess the, I don't know, it could have been the damage from the cra uh, uh, crash or it was the damage from the blast fragmentation warhead, but it was leaking, right? The, 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 I, I would assume it was the cockpit and it was leaking and it was coming out. I mean, it was all over the area. It got on my, you know, my fatigues. I was in it. And uh, so that's what happened there. And but, uh, I don't know what it was. And, you, and it changed colors. Yeah, the, the craft itself was changing colors. Um, um, purple, you know, the, the if, you, if you take like, I mean, you know, when you're, when you're out, uh, say like when you're out, uh, the chemical rainbow, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, like if you're out like scrubbing your car and you have the, uh, you know, joy or whatever, you know, you know, it's kind of the sheen where it's the, the rainbow colors and it was going back and forth. It was weird. I don't know what it was. Like yeah. I said, yeah, and did I can't you, account for any of this. So it's just simply speculation on my yeah. part. Did you happen to notice exactly where it was coming out? Was it coming out at the damage or out of the car? Well, it was. Well, I don't know if it was a cockpit, like I said, but it was. There was a gash in it, and it was. It was flowing out. It, it had spread all over anyway because it was there. You know, obviously prior to me getting there. So, and and when you got it on you, did you feel any type of sensation or anything like burning or anything like that? Uh, I, I can't remember to be honest with you. I did lose all my hair, and, but I, but I, I mean, I was so drenched with sweat, and I was so hot, and you know, yeah, the whole the whole situation the way it was. So. Yeah, right. I would I would be myself. I'd be scared of whatever was coming out of. Sure. So he mentions there that he lost all of his hair. So he says I did lose all of my hair. Was it the hair on his whole body? He actually doesn't talk about personal medical issues. He says towards the end of this interview that he actually did have medical issues, does have ongoing medical issues, but he didn't want to discuss it. This is similar to the hazardous effects alleged in the Virginia case, where it's actually these hostile materials. And if you look at the actual beings, in both cases, the beings themselves are at least acting in a distressed state, and they, they seem to be distressed. And going back to the object here, just th think about this, okay? Any sort of object going fast, imagine an airplane flying into a cliff. What would happen to an airplane flying into a cliff? Okay, it would totally explode. It would just blow up. The fact that this object is just stuck into the side of a cliff, it just makes no sense to me as a crash safety investigator. You know, it would have to be going fast enough to plunge into the, into the side of this cliff but not destroy itself, not just crumble, just seems, yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable account. And so Jonathan gets all this stuff on him. What, what happens next? Let's hear what happens next. Well, the creatures, I think, were calling me to help them. Everything was going to be all right. But I was so mesmerized and into it, and, you know, Sergeant Allen and Atkins, they're, they're hollering and they're cussing at me, you know, get the hell out of there. Well, I, I think they why they I think that they were scared, and they didn't want me to get hurt. I don't I don't know. They were real pissed off at me, after subsequently. But uh, basically, what happened was uh, after we climbed back up, the, uh, the the I think the DOE Department of Energy people were there. They knew about it, and I don't know why we went there. Still to this day, but anyway, I was arrested. Uh, I had all my gear taken from me by men in black camis had no, no name tags. They, they were older men, probably in their thir late 30s or 40s. How long was I at the site? Uh, probably about 15, 20 minutes. We were the first people on, this, on, the, on the position, yeah. And then shortly you said there were other people. Right, uh, there were other people. I guess they were government, I don't know. They were there and they had containment suits and they, they had guys, they, they, they had a position that, 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 was, that looked like, I don't know if it was already there or there was some gap in the jungle where they landed two CH-47 Chinooks, their army uh, uh, twin rotor uh, you know, helicopters, and they're big, and they had guys coming out in these containment suits. They must have just got there, I don't know, while we were down in the gorge, because when we climbed up, there those guys were in the 
Well, there were the, the guys in the black camis. And then they took me, they put me on a cot that they had, and they had me uh, cuffed with those, uh, they had me cuffed both hands down, and then they had my, uh, my, my, my legs tied together with those, those uh, plastic fasteners that the police use. I don't know, you know, they're like kind of like cuffs. And then they took me in the CH 47 and they, they, they sent me to, we, we took off and, and, uh, and, uh, they, they didn't drug me or anything like that. And I was just awake there. And no, no, that they said that, you know, that, 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 that I was, they were cussing at me saying that I was a dumb asshole. Or that, why don't you, why don't you fucking people ever, you know, pay attention to orders and you weren't supposed to be there and you're not supposed to see this and, you know, you're, you're going to be dangerous if we let you go and all this stuff. You know, I mean, I thought I was going to, I thought they were going to kill me for about two days, I think. And, uh, they had a, a Lieutenant Colonel from the air force and he did not I, identify himself. He might've, I just don't remember. And he told me, you know, you know, uh, you know, if we just, uh, took you out in the jungle, you know, they'd never find you out there. And I'm like, well, and, you know, I, I didn't want to say, you know, you know, I didn't want to test him to see if you'd really do that. So I said, yeah. And he's like, you got to sign these papers and you never saw this. And I don't exist. And this situation never happened. And if you tell anybody, uh, you know, you, you'll just come up missing. And, and he was a real abrasive, just just, just a uh, cynical uh, asshole, I guess is the best way to put it. It was I was at the same installation, but they had me segregated with Air Force personnel for like three weeks. And then after that, I was sent back. So Jonathan describes there is basically he, he rolls up on a crash site inadvertently before they had actually established on scene command. Okay. Before they had basically secured the area. And what he says is that secure team was basically en route. That was your en route team, which came on larger helicopters. And what he says is they had containment suits. They were in containment suits in a later interview, Martin Wells, he says 20 or 30 people in full suits, he said, were advanced chem suits went into the area. So that you would normally do that in a hazardous crash. So any sort of crash environment, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, if you do have those composites on the aircraft now, you are going to have to make sure you don't breathe in any of that material. So hazardous suits are a normal crash situation. So that could be part of it. But... What about all the guys in the black suits, unidentified black camo? You know, who are these guys? And then the lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. Again, why is it a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force always? I don't know. I was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. But Jonathan says he was debriefed and forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Last year, 2022, the U.S. Congress passed stronger whistleblower protection acts and they rip up all of these ndas these events that did not ever happen these events that never happened will now go down as actually having happened you can't say this never happened and you can't have someone sign an illegal non-disclosure agreement actually you have to follow the rules of our country and you can't just have your own secret organization out there doing whatever you want willy-nilly jonathan realized that these guys knew what they were doing it was totally routine the people in the the hazardous suits moved quickly. They knew what they were doing. Everyone was in a practiced routine, is what he said. It was a practice routine. This seems like something they'd done before and were trained to do again multiple times. So things I want to highlight there is there was a low hum. Jonathan mentioned the, the craft had a low hum, like an amplifier, like unplugged, but didn't resonate in your body, but he could hear it. Again, he said it was weird. So that's that's quite interesting. He said there were these dark vent sections that had no shadow, if you remember that. There was also one single light on the craft, one single light that was spinning. He said one single light. He also mentioned there was no shadow. So you there was no shadow posted. There was some weird element of the craft. Even though it was metallic looking, it did not reflect any sort of light. Like he says, if he shine a flashlight on it, it wouldn't actually reflect anything back. He also had his being. So you have these beings there. And what did they look like? Your classic gray aliens, hairless aliens, no hair, very large eyes, four fingers. You also have this sort of liquid. So the liquid he said seemed to change colors. It was everywhere, got on him, ruined his fatigues. And he said he lost all his hair at some point. There's also the unbelievable parts of the craft itself, that it was shot down by a hawk. So you had battle damage, 
which frags out to what Jonathan says is the frag pattern of a home all the way killer of your Hawk missile. And yet it didn't destroy the craft, it didn't destroy it, just damaged it enough to where it could actually careen itself into the side of a granite mountain, into the side of a granite mountain. It's not like it's landing in soft snow or soft dirt, right? Basically went into the side of a mountain. Could it just be dirt? Yes, I guess. But the point is any normal aircraft that would that did that would have totally destroyed itself, crashed and blown apart, as well as any, any sort of aircraft taking that amount of frag damage should have exploded. So that is definitely breakthrough tech. And then finally, what you have is the operators. So Jonathan calls out Department of Energy by name. He says that they were actually wearing a jacket, DOE, Department of Energy. Falls under the same program that Oppenheimer started. David Grush's recent interview on American Al Alchemy argues that the UFO program, the UAP program, is hidden under the nuclear programs. Somehow the Department of Energy is intricately related to this. What is the Department of Energy doing in Peru? Honestly, what is DOE doing in Peru? That is a great question. And why do you have unmarked black uniform operators? And why do you have a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, again, making people sign NDAs? This should be insights into a full program that's related to Department of Energy, Special Forces units, combat search and rescue. We have to have mobility. You actually have to have aircraft capable to go there, to go the distance, to bring back the crew or material, if that's what you're going after, and bring it back safely. You need that capability, and the Air Force has that, as well as the Navy and the Marines have limited capability. Like I mentioned, the Marines is all of the forces engaged in their own little microcosmic force. Okay, and that leads into the third interview is Michael Herrera. Michael Herrera was again a Marine, this time in 2009. He was actually called to an operation in Indonesia, of all places. Like Jonathan, Michael talked to Dr. Greer and actually released his story on 12 June 2023, this past summer disclosure event in D.C., YouTuber Sean Ryan met him at that disclosure event and goes through this interview. And Michael Herrera, this actually wasn't a crash retrieval. Michael is called in inadvertently. His team of five Marines are called in, I guess, to secure a certain area and wind up running up onto this crazy operation. Listen to this. I want other people who have witnessed similar things or are part of certain things that are very controversial but end up being true to come out and understand that what's going on is not acceptable. And it this is just a facet of corruption. It may not be the political corruption that's coming out now that people are witnessing with their own eyes. People call them conspiracy theories. What I'm hoping to achieve is to get other people on board to understand that the government supports what we're doing because they were in the dark about this too. And seeing this unfold, even being in this position of having to brief the Senate intelligence, going back to the event, we decided to get in a tactical column and approach this, right? And we got down the slope and it's just like a clearing and just has this big opening. It's almost a little bit more than the football field because this craft took up majority of that. So let, let's just back up for a yeah. minute because at first you said there were helos going, doing racetracks yes. around. Is this the same opening that you described earlier that you were watching helos drop supplies No, 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 no. Okay. So um, where this was happening was southwest, at least where the helo insertion points were with the LZs that they were setting up. And they were flying very low in consideration, in consideration right? So, and the, the reason why I know this is because I asked the pilots after this because I was in the officer's mess and I knew their call signs and I approached them and asked them very respectfully if they noticed anything strange. None of them said anything. Okay. So I was trying to see if they could get a view of a topside because this is just something that's crazy, right? Yeah. So um, also their call signs all stuck out too, you know, because pilots like to do crazy stuff with their call signs. So it was very easy to track them down. But having this happen on the north part of the slope and it goes down and obviously, you know, the way it was transitioning colors, which was kind of the way that it appealed because it was transitioning for a light matte black or no sorry a light matte gray to a dark matte black and just kind of ranging in between right well, let's 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 rewind a little bit before we get into the description okay how far so what was the activity with all the other helicopters were they active at the time that you saw the honestly UAP? I, when we started going down there no 
Um, okay. And I don't know because obviously we're occupied with this. How far do you think it was? So from us, from the LZ where we were at was 300 meters roughly. Okay. Plus the slope that was concealing plus vegetation. Down the slope, it was like three, 400 meters, maybe. So we got close. We trucked down quite a bit. Okay. About 150 meters outside, 150, 200, right? Halfway. And so reason, maybe about a click away. Possibly. Yeah. At the, the, the craft itself might have been a click up. Okay. Yeah. And as like I said, um, the reason why I know how big this thing was because. Did you see it? As you crested the yes the hill yes I did and that so that's where I took videos and pictures of this thing that's how I was able to see it because you know taking pictures of the chaos going behind and everything you see in the rubble of burning buildings flooding and all that kind of stuff and then you turn around and I'm like so you 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 cross this hill yep you look down into into the valley yep and there's a clearing there's a clearing with a UAP yes. Just sitting there. Sitting there covering. rotating clockwise, yep. And that's in transition, this color spectrum I was telling you too. And that's why it's kind of it's something that stuck out. It's not a building, you know. It's not something that you're used to seeing. Maybe topside it could have looked like a building or something that, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I don't have that perspective. I wasn't a pilot or anything. But I can tell you from our point of view, it's something that just it looked very unnatural and abnormal. And that's what got our curiosity to go investigate this. Now, normally because we had, we would have had comms, you're damn right, we'd have called it in. Report something suspicious. Maybe get some eyes on a helo, get a hold of their call signs and try to do them fly around. And they never did. And obviously we didn't have comms to do it, but they were more occupied with what was going on behind us. So when we trucked down and got it around 150 to 200 meters from it, you know, and this is an opening, by the way, um, there's no tactical advantage being in this situation because you don't have cover it's jungle you have concealment but this kind of concealment with vegetation is not bulletproof mm -hmm. so when we trekked up close and we were attack calm so obviously you have points here right at each marine so you have visuals of the sides somebody has point and somebody has the rear and all of a sudden we we're involved by this military force of i still to this day don't know who they are and how close did you get to the craft to the craft roughly 200 meters 150 200 did you get to the bottom of the hill? Yes. So you could see, so you saw the top of it and then you could see underneath of it. And underneath Maybe. of it had this platform that was on the ground that was separate from this craft hovering. And it was, it was very weird to see. And I was like, okay, I don't know if that's kind of like a cement pad or something. I don't know if it was like a helo pad or anything like that at first, but then started seeing how the material would kind of look very similar to what the craft was. It's like, well, that's separate. So you have something that's on the ground stationary, and then you have something that's up top and it's just rotating in a clockwise position. So right when we got close to it, um, at least, you know, 150, 200 meters out, then all of a sudden we were engaged, at least not in a hostile manner, at least, you know, not gunfire or firefight or anything like that. But the way that these guys moved was so fluid, it was so still, it was very, very, very smooth. Okay, so this is in 2009, Michael Herrera, uh, a Marine, he's actually, running point for this five person team. You go down, he crests the hill. And what he says is he sees this amazing sight. It's a clockwise rotating giant octagon. He says that the, the actual color of it was weird. It would change colors. And sometimes it wouldn't be any shadow. That sounds familiar, just like the case I just mentioned. So no shadow, this thing spinning. And he, he also says there's a low hum noise. He said, relates it the same. It's like an amplifier. If you unplugged an amplifier, just the noise, it's not reverberating in your body, but a noise, some sort of low hum noise, the same color. So it looks metallic, but changes color. He also mentions there's a platform underneath the object and these trucks will, will drive up. He says three trucks that he saw with gear in the back. So big boxes, 10 foot boxes in the back drive up onto the platform, and then the platform, he doesn't see the tr where the trucks go, but the platform itself actually raises up as the ship departs. The platform raises, it's part of the ship. And again, the same colors. So as far as similarities between the two incidents, you have the low hum. You also have lights. There was one light on Jonathan's incident. And this one, what he relates is when the craft goes to depart, actually there's a light, different color light, red, blue, and green, he said, different color light at each point of the craft as it departs. So you do have lights. You also have this sort of uh, metallic structure. It's a structure that looks metal, 
but doesn't reflect light. It doesn't reflect light that we understand metal actually reflects light, almost like negative light. It sucks in, absorbs all of your light, if you will. He also mentions changes color, right? It changes color, whereas it interacts weirdly with how we understand light and colors work, what he explains. It's just doing something impossible, right? How can the platform float? How can the object itself actually float? And then the platform actually comes up into the object. So let's go to the, the final similarity is how he was treated. Let's see how he was treated and by who. The material would kind of look very similar to what the craft was. It's like, well, that's separate. So you have something that's on the ground, stationary, and then you have something that's up top and it's just rotating in a clockwise position. So right when we got close to it, um, at least, you know, 150, 200 meters out, then all of a sudden we were engaged, at least not in a hostile manner, at least, you know, not gunfire or firefight or anything like that. But the way that these guys moved was so fluid, it was so still, it was very, very, very smooth. And it kind of indicated to me um, after thinking about it for several years is that these guys have done it for a, a while because of how smooth this operation was. Mm -hmm. So when we were in a tactical column going towards the center of this thing, they actually came from the flanks, but it was more of a diagonal, like a corner of the room, so to speak, right? For them in a tactical advantage, they have interlocking fields of fire on every single person. And they had a team of eight, right? And the gear that they had was black OTV vests. They had black camouflage utilities. They so had, what you're saying is there was there would have been no Mexican, they were professionals. Yes, there would have been yes. no Mexican standoff where no. if they fired, they're shooting into their other squad. They had they, they had perfect angles. Yes, they did. To where both sides could engage you. Yes. Team of four, team to. of four. So it was like a fire team element. Without about. worrying about a blue on blue no. situation. Exactly. Okay. So um, you know, with that being said, because as they as they approached us, you know, hear the safeties flip off. Now your attention to detail when you're seeing this kind of stuff, your sensors are very heightened. So you can pick up. I know you being a combat veteran, you know you know all about that your heightened sense of awareness is going through uh, astronomical changes to hypervigilant. Yes. So you can hear stuff a lot clearer. And that's where you kind of picked up the hum that this object was doing along with these guys flipping their safeties off, especially M4s. You know, it's very distinct sound. Anybody in this room who's held M4s and has shot them M16s, things like that, it's very distinct sound to flipping it off. So um, we kind of knew and they started yelling at us, you know, they were like, you know, you're not supposed to fucking be here. What the fuck are you guys doing here? Who the fuck are you with? You know, so they knew they were using the kind of lingo that we, we were using to, especially the military. So it made me think that at some point, these guys actually were uniform military at one point. Any accents? Uh, not accents. It's just like American dialects, how you and I are talking. Uh, very, you know, they, at one point they said they were going to smoke us. They could throw us out of a helicopter. They could, it's very easy to get lost in the jungle out here. You know, they kept saying stuff like that. So after they enveloped us, they all pretty much got online. They told us to put our weapons. So we all got online as well. And we had our hands. So what Michael relays is these guys were very professional. They knew exactly what they were doing. and They sounded like Americans. They had U.S. dialect. Sean Ryan asked, did you hear any accents? And he said, no accents. So he would have noticed if it was like an Australian accent or something or Eastern European accent, but no, this was US dialects. Okay, so they, they had US weapons. He mentions exactly the weapons that they had. He knew it. He said that they had advanced, some sort of an advanced device, like in today's device to scan their ID cards. But well, this was in 2009. This was actually more advanced than he thought we even had in our special forces. And he thought, just like Jonathan, that they were going to kill him, actually. They said the same things. You're not supposed to be here. We can just, you can just easily get lost in the jungle. And he thought he was actually going to die at one point when they made him turn around and, and face the hillside. And they tied the gun to them, actually, and then let them go. He actually found out later on when he went back, actually, to the ship that his locker was broken into without the lock actually being broken. The memory card was stolen and the battery uh, was also stolen. So both of those things were gone. He checked the camera anyway to see if it had anything on it and it didn't. So his camera, his, his, his photos that he took, his video were all taken. He was also interviewed by a Lieutenant Colonel. A Lieutenant Colonel again asked him to sign an NDA. And by asked, it means made him sign an NDA. So made him sign a non-disclosure agreement. Again, those were all ripped up by last year's new National Defense Authorization Act. So it's protecting whistleblowers. Like he said, he wants whistleblowers to come out and speak because he thinks this is absolutely wrong. And I agree with him. Let's 
Let's look at this final part, final interaction where he talks about the craft leaving. Oh man, it's just mind blowing stuff. Let's check it out. The way you're describing this, I'm envisioning an, an octagon yep. rotating mm -hmm. clockwise with a drop ramp similar to maybe something you would see on the back of a C-130, C-17, but circular. But circular and separate. There's no cables. There's no... Okay. Yeah. Was the ramp attached to the craft? No. So there was just an opening. There was just an opening. Like the bottom part of the craft, I was what I'm assuming because that's where I saw it lift up and go into. It was okay. like the bottom part. It was like the, the floor itself was like the platform and they were just rolled up, right? But at the same time, the, the top part leveled a little bit and went down to meet with this. And as that happened, you start to see it rise up past the tree line. And it's not like a super fast and just rapid. It's just like kind of slow. As that's going on, the rotation has not changed. The audible hum has not changed. But It's not like somebody hit the gas and you hear a different Yeah, it's nothing like that. Noise. It's no, just, just constant. Okay. Each point on that octagonal shape started to illuminate colors. Like, and it was just one color per point. It was red, it was green, it was yellow, and it was blue. It was the only colors I saw, and it was rotating, right? As soon as it got to the top of the tree line, like cleared the trees, this thing shot off to the left. And to the left was the ocean, by the way. This was going west. How far to the left was the ocean? Um, probably a good mile and a half, maybe. That's it? Yeah. It so you're right on the coastline? Yeah. Okay. Probably, I would say, me. It could be a mile and a half to three miles, I'd estimate, because, I mean, that's just estimation. I don't really know, because it took us a little bit when we landed into the uh, near Padang City, because we landed at the airstrip, and then we took, like, a several-minute flight going from southwest to, like, northeast part, roughly. So amazing account of the ship just flying off at unimaginable speeds. Sean Ryan asked, you know, what kind of speed do you think it was going? And he says thousands of miles an hour. He just guessed, speculates 5,000 miles per hour because he is an aviation enthusiast. Growing up, he actually wanted to be a pilot. I'm assuming a fighter pilot, but could not do it for some reason. But he knows a lot about aircraft and watching something like that accelerate off at an unimaginable speed. He said it's the fastest thing he's ever seen in his life. He couldn't even see the colors. It was just like a black blur as it accelerated. And he said it didn't make any impact to the air around it didn't shake the coconuts did nothing there was no sonic boom no sound it didn't even change in the noise of the hum the hum made uh, the same tone the whole time it just pieced out accelerated out of there unimaginable speeds again no sonic boom no sound no impact to the actual environment final elephant in the room on this case is what well, we're in the boxes okay this was not a crash event like the other two was actually a crash Looks like crashed by something we may have shot down, but this wasn't a crash. So what was this thing doing there? What was this UAP doing? What kind of boxes was it moving? And why is it protected by black forces? Black forces with American dialects and American equipment. And they have some sort of interaction with the government because they were able to just push these Marines back to their base, right? Just push back to their base. And then nothing else came of this event that we know about. At least we didn't hear about it in the news. So somehow it is integrated with our military system, the current military industrial complex. Each ship has a uh, logistical support for Marines, right? That are on the ship, either at the security, wherever it is. There was a gunner sergeant there and he was like fucking pissed because we showed back up and we weren't supposed to. And then we had our weapons, you know, so what were we conditioned for? You know, we try to play dumb, so obviously we kind of like set up a perimeter and then we adjusted ourselves. Some of my guys, you know, they'd help us get our stuff unslung and then we'd load it back up and, you know, act like everything was normal. But I can tell everybody's faces were like, what the fuck? Very, very concerning stuff. And here's the thing, though. If stuff is still going on to this day, which I'm sure it is, because if they're, you know, come to find out. And I know you probably know this. Human trafficking is the biggest revenue generator for these guys, mm -hmm. for these organizations. Second's drugs, third is weapons. So if they're hitting all three, and obviously they're not going to want to give up their operations being known for that because it's illegal. It's not going to sit very well in the public eye. A lot of people have children yeah. because then you have the thought in your head that it's going to be my kids are going to end up like this. And having them known to see this happen, it sucks. It's super dark black. It's not like a reflective material at the all. The matte black? 
Yeah, but okay. very, 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 even darker than matte black. Okay. Like you can shine a light at it and it won't even illuminate. Like the Batmobile. Kind of. Okay. Something like that. But even it was like very dark. So what I can describe was like the Vanta black. Okay. And um so, so as, you when you mean absorb light, you're saying if I shine a laser on it, you probably you might not even see the laser correct. or it would be very dull. Correct. Okay. Something like that. So we're watching these vehicles, right? These trucks. Now, the thing I would say on the front of them, because, you know, hum, um, Humvees, the military has, they have the IR lights on the front near the headlights that you can drive at nighttime with your knots. So they had the same thing because they had the same kind of slits that had the IR lights. But they had uh, weapon cases in the back of each truck bed. And, you know, you could store like a couple hundred weapons, maybe a hundred weapons, maybe a platoon, a company size element. And um, it was the same Pelican cases that we would use to store stuff when they were transporting, you know, so very big cases on two of them in each truck bed. And then they had a shipping container thing. I mean, it looked like a shipping container, but smaller and half the size. And the thing that was different about this is I had a cylinder on the front of it that was towards the truck. It was like parallel to the ground, just a cylinder right on the top of this thing. And uh, for years, I thought, okay, you know, like, it's got to be oxygen supplier or like a vacuum sealing thing that you would, you know, because obviously I'm thinking it's drugs. I was like, okay, so this is a very advanced way to do that. Just years of thinking of this. And um, come to find out when I gave my speech in DC on that Saturday for the disclosure project with Dr. Greer, um, he's got a lot of people coming out of the work, woodwork, by the way. And this gentleman, I'm not going to give any detail. I know a little bit about him. But he works in some of these projects at very, um, some very controversial facilities. And he went explaining what the operations do, why they do it, and what they were using them for. And he says, there's not drugs that they're putting in these shipping containers. He says it's humans. Human trafficking. Yes. His own words. And, he, you know, of course. And he also wants to come forward, at least uh, with him and 30 other people that are involved with that part of the work. Um, but it was very disheartening to actually get that information relayed to me because here I'm thinking for years it's drugs and it's a much sinister thing. But it makes sense because they use natural disasters of people who are going to be missing anyway. Yep. It, Scoop up people. Okay, so that's the final elephant in the room. Michael Herrera says that the three trucks he saw had large containers in the back, 10 feet by 8 feet, and they had special advanced equipment on there for biological sort of payloads. Scenes of panic and confusion on the island of Sumatra as the 7.6 magnitude earthquake struck. This is the coastal city of Padang. It sits on one of the world's most active fault lines, known as the Ring of Fire. This is actually on September 30, 2009. A magnitude 7.6 earthquake struck off the west coast of Sumatra, Indonesia causing a mass casualty event. Could that have been related? Weirdly and creepily. So that was three incidents, three cases that gave us pretty good insight into the global UFO program. It seems to be run by some elements of the military industrial complex under the Department of Energy. They have access to Air Force assets that can quickly and rapidly get around the globe to retrieve assets, to plant assets. They have integration with organizations such as the Marines. Okay, if they need extra firepower, they can call in a group of Marines. Maybe they thought someone else was approaching. They needed that extra group of Marines out there to keep people away from that site. Could there have been other enemies closing in to that site and they needed just the quickest people to get there? Could have been a similar case where they shot down an aircraft in Peru and then accidentally again sent a reaction force to maybe secure the area. They didn't know if they'd actually have to fight anyone. These three incidents, what do we see as similarities? The first thing is you have a wingless vehicle. In Virginia, it was a tic-tac looking object, uh, smoking crashed. In the second incident with Jonathan, you basically had a similar large tic-tac tear-shaped object, gray metal, but not metal, doesn't reflect any light. That's in the same instance as Michael Herrera. His actual object is an octagon, rotating octagon with lights, okay, rotating. And you notice a, a low hum in both of those instances. You have the same material. It's this matte gray, matte black kind of material. It doesn't reflect any light. It actually absorbs all of your light 
has no shadows. And in all of the events, we have some sort of biological material. We have biological entities. There's beings in Virginia that resemble the normal gray aliens that we're talking about, except we have one with red eyes now. Could it be red eyes from the environment, from the atmosphere? They have four fingers, and it sounds like telepathically can communicate. That's what we've heard in other cases as well. What we also have is hazardous materials. Any crash is going to have hazardous materials. Composites through the air are just as hazardous to humans as the supposed color-changing liquid. We had a human die in Virginia based on touching the, the supposed beings, and then we had negative effects from Jonathan when his fatigues were destroyed and he lost all of his hair. He said all of his hair. All the equipment and the personnel, so the people that are there in the black suits, unidentified, the men in black, if you will. Men in black are not just in suits. They also have ACOG machine guns and laser range finders, advanced laser range finders. They have American dialects. So these sound like older gentlemen. He said late 30s, early, early 40s. So about my age, your senior lieutenant colonels, if you will, all in unidentified blacked out materials. They're very well trained. They're well organized. They, they were able to ambush Michael Herrera's team without firing any shots. They also ambushed Jonathan without firing any shots. Okay, so these people are smart. You don't want to have to make a lot of noise in a professional engagement, right? If you don't have to. You're not going to have to kill any people if you don't have to. Now, why didn't they kill him? That also relates. In both cases, they could have just killed them, right? Thrown them out the helicopter. Why not just make these guys disappear? That also kind of hints to them being U.S. military or previous military, almost like they didn't want to, or maybe there's an instance where, yeah, why don't we let this guy go? He's just a dumb Marine. No one's going to believe him. We took all of his information. We took all of his photographs. Who's going to believe that he saw this giant floating octagon with trucks getting weightlessly loaded up into it? Although he didn't say the trucks were loaded into it. He didn't see the trucks. And then is it all linked through Department of Energy? You know, who would have the top cover? Who can actually make that call from that level to say, no, we need to get these Marines, put them back to the base, arrest that person. I need to go through his locker. You have this sort of capability to just make incidents go away. And then you have the final thing is the lieutenant colonel, the Air Force lieutenant colonel. Another Air Force lieutenant colonel, like me, I was a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel, but who is this guy out there debriefing people, threatening them, and making them sign non-disclosure agreements? on disclosure agreements that don't hold any weight anymore, don't hold any water at all, because your organization is illegal. All of this is illegal, and it's coming out. It is definitely coming out. There's people out there hijacking other people, hijacking other Americans. You're going to hijack a Marine and then threaten to murder them, probably murdered other ones. Definitely illegal. And as Michael says now, the Congress is engaged. The Congress is armed with this knowledge. He's already testified to Congress, the Senate Armed Services Subcommittee. And the question is, what are they going to do with this information? I think these three incidents, Virginia shows that the U.S. is ready. C-130s arrived very quickly. Case was all locked down. And then you have American English-speaking people afterwards paying people off and in black, shutting all the information down. And we go to Jonathan Wagant, a year after Virginia, in Peru, so nearby country, he haphazardly is called to go to what they determined would be a friendly aircraft crash and is hijacked. He sees Department of Energy uh, jackets there, but I think they got smart for the third incident, Michael Herrera, 2009, out in Indonesia. Now, those seems like, sounds like the same people have what could be a reverse engineered craft of their own now. They got rid of the jackets, the DOE jackets, if you will, but it sounds like the same type of people. But what are they moving? What are you moving boxes of biological material out of a humanitarian crisis zone? Sounds very, very sketchy, uh, ridiculous, okay? But this stuff needs to come out. These three cases show, I think, an insight, gives us a, a window into the actual global UFO program that is allegedly and most likely going on right now. Hopefully that comes out with people like David Grush, Blue heroes like Marines Michael Herrera, Jonathan Wagant. Thank you all so much for speaking out. Continue to do so. 
and I, I encourage more whistleblowers to come out. This stuff has to come out. It's so wrong. It's so illegal. It sounds just so illegal. Can't believe it's going on. But that's why it's it's gone on so long. It's just we can't believe it. Hope you guys like this video. Please smash that like button. Share this video to get the information out and then get access to exclusive content, behind the scenes, early access, ad-free videos at patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato or as a YouTube member. I also post on X. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Peace.